Happy Thursday, everybody. What uh, what beautiful weather we are getting here in Wisconsin. Um, this is not, it's February, right? It's February 22nd. This is not February weather for Wisconsin. It should, and I'm not saying I want it to, it should be 20 below today, not 50 above. Um, generally in February, we get a week or two weeks where the air temperature is literally below zero all day, every day for a couple of weeks. We did not get that this year. So um, in fact, it's so warm so early, uh, we're already tapping trees, which is crazy early for tapping trees for maple syrup. Um, it's usually maybe closer to Easter. So as a measure of how weirdly warm it is, um, we've been tapping trees for three weeks or so already. So stuff that's totally unrelated to what we're here to do, but maybe interesting anyway. Um, what we're here to do is talk about using the router as a router table as a jointer. So a couple compelling things for this. One, if you don't own a jointer, um, you can use your router table as a jointer. It works very effectively. So an alternative to that would be to use a hand plane. I am not a great hand tool guy. I would much rather find a power tool solution to getting my edges um, square, straight, and smooth than a hand plane, because that's just not gonna go great for me. Even if you own a jointer, there are good reasons to do jointing on a router table, and we're gonna talk about that. So the setup isn't difficult to do, but some things have to happen here. So think about, um, if, if you're familiar with how a conventional jointer works, what happens is we have an outfeed table and a cutter head and an infeed table. The outfeed table and the cutter are in line with each other. So in other words, at top of rotation on the cutter, the top of that circumference is perfectly even with the top of the outfeed table. The infeed table on most jointers is adjustable up and down. So we lower that below the plane of the outfeed table, which of course is lined up with the cutter. So we lower the infeed table and the amount we lower it is the amount of wood that's gonna come off when we make a jointer pass. Typically a 32nd, maybe a 16th of an inch. So where I'm going with all this, what's really important to understand is we have to have that offset. When we do this on a router table, it's not as simple as just put a bit in, and we're gonna talk about the right router bit for this. It's not as simple as just throw in a router bit and put your fence on and go. We have to make some accommodations in the router table fence. Some manufacturers are anticipating this, and in order to make it easy for you to do this, they're accommodating with their fence a means by which you can use your router table as a jointer. Um, if yours doesn't, I'm gonna show you a shop made fence that lets you do this. So let's talk about um, why would I wanna do this if I already own a jointer? So one reason would be a lot of jointers still have steel knives in them. And you should never put man-made stuff over a steel knife jointer. So I'm, as opposed to a carbide insert jointer head. If you've got carbide inserts in your jointer, you can pretty much joint anything you want. But if you've got steel knives in your jointer, like MDF, plexiglass, plywood, that stuff would be really abrasive to those knives and dull them really, really, really quickly. In a router table, of course, we can put in a carbide router bit. So we're gaining the same benefit as we get from a carbide insert jointer, which is we can stand up to better materials. The other thing is just quality of cut. So if you're working with something that's squirrely, bird's eye maple is a great example, birch is a great example, it can be difficult to joint a good edge. So let's do some math. Most, most joiners run at 6,000 RPM and typically have three knives in them or three rows of cutters. So three times 6,000, no, 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 is 18,000 cuts per minute. On a router table, most routers run at 24,000 RPM. And most router bits 
have two flutes. So let's do math again. Two flute router bit, 24,000 ripums, 48,000 cuts per minute. That higher cut per minute figures into figured wood. So again, something like bird's eye maple that's prone to chipping, you can get a significantly better cut quality off of your jointer than you can, I'm sorry, off your router table than you can off your jointer, which I'm pointing to, even though you don't know it's over there, um, because we're running at more cuts per minute on the jointer. Um, the other thing, when we look at router bits, I'm gonna come back to this helical idea, which is another benefit to doing this on the router table. But let me look, um, I'm gonna change cameras and we'll look at the router bits. But while we're here, let me see what we've got cooking for questions. Okay. Um, I've been having trouble with my jointer and now should be able to have another way to do it on my Bosch router table. Okay. Kenny says, would you plane your boards to final size before jointing or the other way around? Well, you still wanna have, just like on a jointer jointer, you wanna have good faces. So in the perfect world, this is a lovely piece of white oak. Um, I would want these, I would want this surfaced so that when that face goes down on the router table, I'm producing an edge perpendicular to that face. If this is still rough sawn, which if that's what you mean, if this is still rough sawn when I do this step, um, the edge I, and then I go and, and I joint it, and then I go plane it, this edge may or may not be perpendicular to those new surfaces. So get it S2S, surface two sides first, then come back and clean up an edge. Okay. All right, so let's look at router bits. So you can do this a bunch of different ways. It's good to have options. This cutter, which is my favorite, is sourced for you in the description of the video. So, um, yeah, I just did a double check. This is sourced for you in the description with the video. So let's start here. I've got this one here, three quarter inch diameter, carbide, straight flutes, one inch cut length. Whoops, playing dominoes. One inch cut length, meaning the length of the carbide. So I have this one here because a lot of people own a bit like this. It could be a three quarter diameter, half inch diameter, three eighths diameter. My point being, you can take a conventional straight flute router bit that you would use to cut dados or rabbits, and you could do what we're about to do with this cutter. Half inch diameter flush trim bit. So in a second, you're gonna see me set up this fence. The benefit to a flush trim bit is that bearing is directly in line with the cutters on the bit. The diameter of the bearing and the diameter of the carbide is the same. So when we get to setup, you'll see this makes setup on the router table a little bit easier. I like this bit because it's helical. So one of the benefits to a helical jointer or planer or router bit is that we're shearing across the surface rather than attacking it straight. So putting a helical head in your jointer is a really, really expensive thing. Putting a helical head, quotation marks in the air, in your router, this is still a more expensive bit than this, but it's nowhere near as expensive as a helical cutter head in a jointer. So again, if you get up against a squirrely grain that's giving you trouble on the joiner, use your helical bit, your spiral bit in the router table, and you're going to get a really, really nice edge off of this. Um, someone's probably going to ask, this one is an up cut spiral. It honestly doesn't matter for what we're doing here if you're up cut or down cut. So for me, I like this because of the cut quality it produces. I'm gonna talk about the benefit to that flush trim when we get to that step. So while I'm standing here and this is open, router's unplugged, 
let me put this bit in. And then the next thing we got to figure out is what accommodations we have to make in the fence. Remember, I talked about we need to offset the fence just like the fence on a joiner. Going down. Outdoor sporting goods, third floor. All right, somewhere about there it is smurferific for height. Now, fence. Let me come back out. So one of the things I talked about is some manufacturers, this is a Rockler router table, including Rockler, have made accommodations with their fence for you to use this as a jointer. That's what I'm gonna do. If you don't have that, no sweat, you can have this. So this is a shop made version of what I'm about to do with that fence. What I've got going here is a fence that I made out of melamine. And this was all one piece, the fence component. The base component was all one piece. There are little gizmos here um, to just help support that to keep it square. The key to this to get an offset that we need for jointing is this. That's a piece of plastic laminate applied to only the outfeed side. So because that's there, the plane of the fence on this side is here. The plane of the fence on this side is 1 16th of an inch that way. You can buy plastic laminate commonly in two grades, vertical grade and horizontal grade. Vertical grade is thinner. It's closer to a 32nd of an inch thick. Countertop grade is closer to a 16th of an inch thick. It's countertop grade I have on here. So what that dictates is that each pass I make is gonna remove a 16th of an inch of material when I use this fence. That little groovy groove right there, that notch, is so that I, I have to have some place for the bit to bury partially into the fence. And that's what that's for. Setup, whether I'm using this or the commercially made, the Rockler fence in this case, is exactly the same. So we have to have a means by which we can offset. This is a way to do it shop made by applying plastic laminate to half of the fence. When it's done for you, um, I'm gonna look for questions quickly. All right. So when this is done for you by the manufacturer, it's a different dealio. When you look at that aluminum extrusion, there's a pocket and a pocket and a pocket and a pocket. This fence came with these pieces of aluminum or aluminum. What we do with those is loosen the fence. So there's a knob there, kind of behind that lock knob. There's a knob there. There's another one back here. When that's loose, the face can come away from that aluminum extrusion. When I put these rails into that pocket, that's the shallower of the two, it pushes the fence out, I think a 16th of an inch. When I put these into the deeper of the two, it pushes me out, I believe, a 32nd of an inch. So I'm going on both of these into the deeper of the two, and then just lock the fence back down. So and I'm, that pulls the fence, that pulls the fence against those aluminum bars. So the offset is automatic. I've seen this executed a little bit differently by different companies. Um, this is fairly common, being able to push bars in there. Another approach is the entire fence comes off, but it came with shims. 
then you put a thin shim behind there to get a 30 second or uh, a six, no, am I saying it right? No, yes. Put, <laughs> put a thin shim behind there to get a 32nd, a thick shim behind there to get a 16th. All right, so what that did on our fence is now this face is no, 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 no. A 32nd of an inch beyond this face. So, next thing, what do we do? Do with that. How do we set the fence? For that, what we have to make happen, just like on a joiner, and again, router's unplugged while I'm messing with it here. Just like on a joiner, we've got to get top dead center of that cutter in line with the outfeed fence. One way to do that is to just put a ruler on here and move the fence. I'm going to close up my opening a little. Move the fence until it's close. Right there, it's pretty close. So I'm going to lock this back end. I'm tightening the knob back here. Now I'm just going to pivot like this, and I'm going to finalize this. So. In that position, right now, I can see a gap right there. The ruler is on the carbide. There's a gap between the ruler and the fence. So I bring that forward until the gap goes away and then lock this end. And at the end of the day, do what you can to get this right, but a test cut is gonna tell us if it's right or not. Now, while we're right there, let's look at this. So remember I said there is a distinct advantage to doing this with a flush trim bit. This makes your setup not just easier, but way more easier. Because in this case, remember, the bearing is in line with the cutters. If I've got a flush trim router bit in here, all I have to do is put the ruler on that bearing and then align the fence with the ruler, and you're gonna be really, 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 I'd still do a test cut, but you're gonna be really close. So it's less fussy, the setup is less fussy if you do it with a flush trim bit than with a um, non-flush trim. But I like that I own this spiral router bit, um, and again, I like the surface finish that comes off of this. So I'm going through this with a spiral to show you how to do it, and then we can look at that surface finish. Now we're going to be ready for a cut. Whilst I cruise for questions. Okay. Um, so somebody said, cool, I use playing cards to shim the fence out, which is fine. Um, somebody told me once playing cards are five thousandths of an inch thick. And I think I'd buy that. Printer paper is three thousandths of an inch. So if you do a couple of playing cards back there, you can, based on the number of cards you use, you can track how far you're pushing the outfeed fence out. Same concept. Um, Clayton says, I assume we're limited to about three quarter inch stock. So it's a great question. And I was going to get to the, uh, the negatives of this in a little bit, but we can address this one now. So I have found this works well up to about one inch thick. When we get over that, we're talking about a lot of router bit sticking out, sticking out of the table. If you want to do this on inch and a half stock, probably going to be okay. I would definitely set it for the 132nd pass, not the 116th pass to get the best, to, to reduce the opportunity for the bit to flutter. So think about point of contact with the collet is down here and that's going to be below the table. We got a lot of router bits sticking up above the table. At the top of that inch and a half stock, you might be two inches away from the collet. 
So the thicker the stack gets, the more propensity there's gonna be for some flutter in the cutter. Um, so it works great for three quarter, works well for four quarter, inch and a half is really gonna be the limitation of what we can do. The other thing we can't do here that a conventional joiner will let you do, we can't face joint. So face jointing is I've got a board that's kind of twisted sister. And in order to take the twist out of it, I would push it over the jointer this way to flatten the face. Then I would plane the other face to get them parallel. Then I would joint the edge. So this is great for edge jointing, call it up to four quarter, um, can't face joint, can't go uber thick. Doug says, where will this video be saved so I can refer to it later? Aki, right where you are right now, right where you're watching. So every live stream um, we have ever done is on this page. So all the way back to, I think I mentioned this a week ago, uh, when we used to use Google Hangouts and we would get so many people watching, we would crash Google Hangouts, um, which led us to believe we needed a different platform to do live streams. So um, all of this stuff is, um, all of this stuff is always saved here on WWGOA. Um, Judy says, are plans for the shop made fence available? N no, because it's just, um, it's an L-shaped build. So make an L a little bit longer than your router table and then put laminate on half of it. So pretty, fairly straightforward there. Um, Craig says, oh, Clayton says, how many playing cards should we use if we shim it with the uh, cheaper Rockler fence? So if you don't have this in whatever router table you're using and you're gonna use shims, it'll just be based on how much offset you want. So. I don't, I think playing cards are maybe around 5,000s. I don't know. Um, somewhere here I have playing cards because we shoot at them at the archery target. And somewhere here, right over there, I have digital calipers. They're not right here in front of me. Um, so 32nd of an inch is about 30,000s. So you can use as many or as few shims as you want to get the offset that you want. Craig says, is there a difference in cut quality with a larger diameter bit? Not measurably. Um, I would say it's more about flutter. Like I'm, I'm more prone to doing this with a half inch diameter bit than a one quarter inch diameter bit. Because again, in, in even in our thinner stock, three quarter inch, um, I'd be afraid of a quarter inch bit of introducing a little flutter to a quarter inch cutter um, where with a more robust shank, half inch shank, half inch bit, um, we're less likely to get that. So not from a, like a rim speed perspective, um, but just from a uh, stability perspective. Ray says, I'm needing to join a few eight foot long boards for a glue up how long a fence would I need to make that length work? So you, as a general rule, anytime you're jointing, the thing you're jointing on, you, you can joint stuff about twice as long as what you're working on. So what I've seen some people do who are like, this is their joiner, um, is make another table that lays over this table so that you have wings out here and wings over there, and that'll let you joint longer stuff. Um, a good friend of mine who's done a lot of work for WWGOA, Dave McKintrick, that's a setup he's got in his shop for his router table. So you just have to, you have to build this out. Um, so overall length, I'd want that four feet or more if you're looking to joint eight foot stock on your jointer. Um, Max has put up a link that's got all of our archived, archived, it's a master list of all the archived live events. So you can use that as a resource. What horsepower router? It takes very little to do this. This could be the ubiquitous Porter Cable 690 one and a half horsepower router, and you would be fine. Um, it, all we're driving is a half inch diameter bit. It takes very little oomph to make this happen. Brent says, um, for other shims, you could use pieces of plastic laminate, um, which also work great. So again, 
um, if you can get just to, you know, stop at a cabinet shop and see if they'll give you a little off cut of plastic laminate with which you could either build the shop made fence or you could use the laminate to make shims to put behind your router table fence that doesn't accommodate shims like this one does. Um, if you've got a dado head and you've got dado shims with that, that would be another alternative to shim this out. All right, let's see, let's do a test cut and see what we're looking for. So when I pass this board across that bit, one of three things were gonna, are gonna happen. If you've been good, if you're a good group of students, this is gonna smoothly pass across that. That'd be wonderful. That means the setup is perfect. Alternatively, we come across, we get past the cutter and the edge butts into, it hits the outfeed fence and can't keep going. That tells me I'm not taking enough material off. The fence is too close to me. The fence is too far forward. Third possibility is I cut, 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 cut. And when I get to the end, it kind of falls into the bit. Chunk, you'd hear it. That's a snipe. That tells me I'm taking too much material off. The fence is too far that way. Then you got to tweak it forward just a little bit. So first, let's try this and see what happens. And then um, we'll adjust if we need to. smooth. Now, you probably didn't hear the chunk, but let's see. Let's try camera two. Oh, that's not bad. Look right there. There's a tiny overcut right there. So smooth, 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 snipe. So again, what does that tell us? Everybody put on their thinking caps for a second. That tells us the fence is too far back. I'm taking too much material off. So a way that I like to control this is we have to come forward just a tiny bit. Do not, 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 not loosen both ends of the fence. It's gonna move too much. I'm gonna loosen one knob, this one back here, and I'm gonna move it just a little. I'm also gonna mark its current position. I really like these white tables for this purpose. So now I've got a pencil mark, shows me exactly where I am. I'm gonna loosen and I'm gonna move forward and I'm gonna cover that pencil line. And then second verse, same as the first, I'll leave the camera where it is for this one. I went the reason I went a second time is when that wasn't correctly set on pass number one and I did this it made that edge a little kerfluey it wasn't very straight anymore so on the first pass I got some of the kerflueyness out technical term on the second pass I got the rest of the kerflueyness out so that that resulting edge is straight one of the things I can see that you can't see is I am looking right down here as I cut. And that tells me a lot. I can see by that edges, that edges relationship to the fence, what's going on here, even before I get to the end of the cut. Now let's go the other way 
Uh, well, let me look for questions first. I have said this before, but I'm going to say it again. I This multi-camera setup, if, if you've been watching me do lives for a while, certainly if you've been watching since the Google Hangout days, even six months ago, we were quantum leaps above Google Hangout. If you've been watching in the last month and seen the effect of the new multi-camera setup in my shop, this is like crazy cool. Um, that I can touch a button and I'm transitioning you from to three different cameras. Um, so um, I'm not I'm not asking for applause on that. I'm just saying like I'm enough of a tech geek that I think this is like crazy cool. <laughs> um, it makes it so much easier for me. I think I'm no longer making you uh, take Dramamine as you watch because all those camera moves I was doing previously. Um, so better, better all around. Okay. Clayton says, does it matter if you pass the snipe and at the beginning or trailing? I'm not sure what you mean. It's gonna snipe at the tail end of the cut. If you're taking off too much material, it's gonna snipe at the end of the cut. Um, Stan says, if the fence is too far back, would you not also see a gap? Yeah, so that's where, when I was just talking about like, so as I do this, I'm doing the whole pass so I can show you the whole thing. But as I do this, I know pretty much right away if the fence is okay or not. And it's it's small increments of an inch. It's small parts of an inch are the difference between good and bad. But when this is right, it's transitioning from in feed to out feed smoothly without any gaps. If I'm taking off too much, which is gonna lead to a snipe, I, I can really tell by the time the board is about there, um, I can tell that it's kerfluey. Let's go. Um, well, let's do this. I'm gonna I'm gonna go one more time. I'm just gonna leave the camera where it is. So great pass. Let's see if if I do that. So remember with a joiner, what we're after is smooth, straight, square. So smooth, if it was rough sawn prior to this, we want that off. Straight from that corner to that corner, we want a straight line. That's what adjusting the fence gives us. And then smooth, straight, square, square perpendicular to the face, which will come from our router table. But on that edge, which again, this is a piece of white oak, I have zero problems. That is that is ready for a glue up, just like that. Now, the other thing I talked about is we've got a carbide router bit in there and I'm dropping stuff. We've got a carbide router bit in there, so if you want to edge joint mad made stuff, you go. So plywood, how about Plexiglass. I'm going to try to give you a before and after. Where are we? So that is table saw cut. Yeah. 
this is such a nice way to clean up edges on polycarbonate um, to get away from the saw marks you have left from cutting that on a table saw. Now, while we're in close like this, let me, I'm gonna sneak the fence a little past this line. So now we're not, we shouldn't be taking enough off. The result of that is when I get, let that stop. The result of that is that when I get here, I can feel that lead corner bumping into the outfeed fence. If I just keep going, if I force it over that, it'll climb up on that outfeed fence, but I'm not gonna get a straight edge. So you wanna just be subtle here. And if, if you feel that hitting, you've gotta move the fence back a little bit. It's pretty cool. It's a great, um, it's a great technique just to have kind of in your back pocket. Um, like I said, if you don't own a jointer, now you do. So I just saved you $500. Um, if you have, if you have limited space in your shop, um, I've said to people a lot of times, like, you know, a question we get quite frequently is what tool should I buy when I'm starting out? You could forego getting to save money you could forego getting a joiner and get a router table and then there's so much versatility here there's so many things you can do on a router table in addition to jointing and the router motor can come out and get used handheld for a bunch of other stuff if you have limited space maybe you don't need to add a footprint of a jointer to your shop at all again we're limited in thickness we can't face joint but if what this does works for you maybe you never need to buy a joiner to correct the sniped end. Oh, hang on, I got a backtrack. All right, so Clayton is saying, I think, when you get a snipe and then you fix the fence and then you're straightening that edge, does it matter if you lead or trail the snipe? No. Um, at that point, you're still ju you're just straightening the kerflui edge. Um, the other thing that's more forgiving here is so it's back to like bird's eye maple and birch um, woods that can be difficult to join without chipping is one of the things I teach is feed direction on a jointer. And it's this whole cat hair explanation that I've been doing for a bunch of years. Um, with a router table, again, because we're getting so many more cuts per minute out of a router than we are out of a jointer, this is way more forgiving. So if you have a piece, yeah, well, this oak is is that way where on this one, if I get you right in the light, the grain here is going up in this direction. The grain here is going up in this direction. So on a jointer, it's possible that if I cut it this way, if I start here and cut this way, this grain is like this, that grain would lay down. But because this grain is up this way, again, cat hairs, if I'm petting the cat against the direction of its hair, it doesn't like that. If I pet the wood in the wrong direction, that might show up by getting chips in the grain here. The router is much more forgiving. Clearly, I didn't get any chips in this, although technically I'm jointing the wrong way on one end of this board. Um, so because of the cuts per minute, um, this can give you um, superior results to a jointer anyway. Okay. So, um, one of the things we've got going for you, I'll talk a little bit to see if other questions come in, um, is we have put together a guide on a joinery guide. And um, like a lot of stuff we've got, this is a great shop resource. So, um, what it's gonna do for you is you're about to build a project, you're trying to decide dovetail, dado, 
pocket hole. So uh, one of my authors worked on this thing extensively. There's great images. There are great images of the joints. There's great text explaining pros and cons of each of the joints. So um, you can grab that download. We've got the link right below where you're watching. Um, and you can grab that download and have that as a resource in your shop. Very, very handy PDF guide to have. Um, Russell says, um, it works great. I have a jointer, but still use this method. Yeah, same. So it's just, it's nice to know about, because if you get into scenarios, like I've talked about man-made material, uh, squirrely wood. Um, Clayton says, uh, pros, cons versus jig on the table saw. Yeah, so I've, I've got a straight line jig for my table saw. I would say even if you use a glue joint rip blade, a glue joint rip blade is going to give you a good cut quality. A router or a joiner is going to give you way better cut quality. So um, if you've built your straight line jig well, meaning it really is straight, you can get a straight edge and you can get a square edge on a table saw. You're going to get a smoother edge, which means a better glue up from a jointer or a router table. Do you ever use a sled if the wood is super crooked? Well, no, because you're, again, you want to be surface, you want to be S2S when you come here, surface two sides. So at that point, if it's crooked, if it's banana shaped, I, I'm not sure how you'd incorporate a sled into this because um, we want those flat faces against the router table and we want the concave edge against the fence and then through making multiple passes we're going to take the concave out uh, with a variable speed router what speed would you recommend for different woods i i wouldn't change it it's running full bore right now i wouldn't um change the rpm of the router dependent on species i would just leave it right where it is charles says this looks safer than a joiner when doing small parts i agree and I would say, if you're teaching somebody to joint an edge, and, and for the sake of showing you stuff, I'm not, I don't have this on, but this is the guard that came with the router table. So if you're teaching somebody woodworking and they're gonna joint edges, get in there. Thank you. And this is here, and we're doing this. You're, you are very well protected here. You're, you are, I would say, better protected jointing here than you are jointing on a jointer. So yeah, I agree, this is, this is nice and safe. It's a little bit like, um, I've said this before about the bandsaw, when my kids were learning woodworking, they did all of their ripping on a bandsaw before they did ripping on a table saw. Because with a fence on the bandsaw, um, that was a safer setup than a fence on a table saw and ripping there. Okay. Well, that sets us up there. So um, watch your email, the April live q and I'm going to have a, I know that's a long way out, but I'm going to have a guest in the shop for that. So you're definitely going to want to be here for the four o'clock live in April. It's going to be a really, really good one. Um, and other than that, we're set there. So thanks everybody for watching and uh, I appreciate that. And I'll see you the next time we do this, whenever that is.